Uh, let's go to Hebrews, Hebrews 11. A few weeks ago, I talked from um, the first three verses, and we're going to be in Hebrews for a little bit. Hebrews 11, I want to go kind of character by character and story by story through the Bible. I want to learn about faith. I want to learn about the journeys of faith that heroes took and people took before us and glean from that and what can it speak to us. So we're going to be in Hebrews 11, 4, and then we're going to switch over to Genesis 4 because that's kind of where the story takes place. And um, Denise, can you be ready to read Deuteronomy 26, 12, and 13? I'm going to go to that, but I don't want, I don't need everyone to turn to that. I just need someone who can read loud and I know you can do that. So Deuteronomy 26, 12, and 13, just be ready with that. So much easier with your phones now, isn't it? <laughs> so Hebrews 11, 4 says, By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commanded, he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks even though he is dead. And that's the only verse we're going to read from Hebrews. So I'm going to read it again. By faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. By faith, he was commended as righteous. And when God spoke well of his offerings. And by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. A couple of years ago, I coached a basketball team. And I wasn't a very good coach. That's why I only did it for one year. And uh, I didn't have too much patience, and I'm not a very good. Learned I'm not a very good teacher, but I caught. I coached this basketball team that was it was like <laughs> fifth and sixth graders, and um, so you know they're not. None of them are superstars, and uh, and they were just kind of learning the game. And I had one player. His name was Isaiah. He actually used to go to church with me when he was young, but his name was Isaiah. And Isaiah really, really, really wanted to be on the basketball team. And he wasn't the greatest player, but he had the kind of heart and passion to learn the game and to uh, be on the team. He worked hard. He, he worked hard whether it was a practice or a game. He had a great attitude. He wanted to learn. He was just the kind of kid every coach dreams of. And even though he wasn't good, I loved having him on the team. And then I had another player who was really good and he knew it. And so he didn't take being on the team very seriously at all. He knew that even if he didn't try hard in practice, even if he didn't have the best attitude, he was probably going to get a lot of playing time because he was our best player. And so I was thankful to have him on the team. And I could see that he had a lot of, you know, talent and athletic ability and he was good at basketball, but I didn't enjoy having him on the team as much as I enjoyed having Isaiah on the team. Again, I was grateful that he was on the team because he would help us score baskets and win games and play well and but when I talk about Isaiah, do you hear the different ways I talk about him? <laughs> I speak well of him. And they were both on the team, right? It's not that one of them wasn't a part of the team and the other worse. They were both on the team. But when it comes to what Isaiah brought to the team and what he offered to the team, it's a whole lot easier for me to speak well of Isaiah, even though he wasn't the greatest player. In fact, uh, for, for a long time, I didn't realize the kid wore glasses. And um, so he wouldn't wear glasses during the game. And most of his shots wouldn't even hit the backboard. And then one game, I found out he wore glasses. So I made him wear glasses while he played. And he scored his first basket. <laughs> and so it's kind of like, hey, you know, why didn't you wear these the whole game? He's like, I didn't want to look stupid. <laughs> so, you know, I speak well of Isaiah. And 
it really reminds me a lot of this verse here in Hebrews. Because it says, by faith, Abel brought God a better offering than Cain did. What Isaiah brought to that team, in my opinion, was better than the kid that was really good. And then it says, um, by faith he was commended as righteous when God spoke well of his offerings. And as a coach, it's really, it was really easy for me to speak well of Isaiah because of what he offered, because of what he brought, because of the attitude and the heart that he had. And then it says, and by faith, Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. And even, you know, I coached this team probably back in like 05, 06. And I'm still talking about this young man and the impact he made in my brain because of the way that he uh, went about playing on the team. And that's the way that it is with faith, okay? That's the way that it is with our actions and with our life. Righteousness and salvation are guaranteed. We have that. That puts us on the team. You're on the team. But what are you bringing as an offering? What does God say about it? And how is the legacy and the destiny of your actions going to live on after you leave this earth? Because the Bible says that Abel brought a better offering. And we're going to go to Genesis 4 in a minute to figure out what that means. But it says he brought a better offering. It says God spoke well of his offerings. And it says that Abel still speaks, even though he is dead. I think a lot of times we as Christians, we take for granted that we're on the team. Righteousness, salvation, grace, it's, it's, it's not something we have to earn. And so we, we take for granted the kind of life that we have to live. And so let's go to Hebrews 4 to kind of figure out the better offering that Abel brought. It's in Gen Genesis 4. And we'll start, we'll start in verse, uh, verse 2. Right at the second paragraph there of Genesis 4. It says, now Abel kept flocks. So he probably had sheep or something. And Cain worked the soil. He was a farmer. It says, in the course of time, Cain brought some. Everyone say some. In the course of time, Cain brought some of the fruits of the soil as an offering to the Lord. And Abel also brought an offering, fat portions from some of the firstborn of his flock. And the Lord looked with favor on Abel and his offering, but on Cain and his offering, he did not look with favor. So Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. And the Lord said to Cain, why are you angry? Why is your face downcast? If you do what is right, will you not be accepted? But if you do not do what is right, sin is crouching at your door. It desires to have you, but you must rule over it. Now Cain said to his brother Abel, let's go out to the field. While they were in the field, Cain attacked his brother Abel and killed him. The Lord said to Cain, where is your brother Abel? I don't know, he replied. Am I my brother's keeper? The Lord said, what have you done? Listen, your brother's blood cries out to me from the ground. Now you are under a curse and driven from the ground, which opened its mouth to receive your brother's blood from your hand. When you work the ground, it will no longer yield its crops from you. You will be a restless wanderer on the earth. I love what Genesis 4, I really believe it's the, the whole key to why Abel brought a better offering than Cain. It says Cain brought some of what he had. And then it says Abel brought the firstborn of what he had. The, he made it the priority. And I want to talk to you today about the difference between bringing something versus bringing the first thing. A couple of years ago, I was at a, a birthday party for a coworker. You know how they have those at lunchtime or break time. Everybody will get a cake and they'll have the birthday cake for the 
for the birthday person. And, and it, it, with this particular cake, I walked into the room and it wasn't cut yet. And there was like, in my opinion, the perfect piece of cake because I don't like a lot of frosting. And I felt like it was the perfect balance of cake and frosting. And that's the piece that I wanted. And I saw it, but it wasn't my birthday. So I didn't get the first choice. So we sang to him and, you know, they get to, they, they get to pick the first piece of cake. And, you know, thankfully they didn't pick the, the piece I wanted. So I got the piece I wanted, but we honor the person's birthday, right, for who it is by giving them the first choice. That's how you honor people, right? Like how silly would it be for you to say, hey, Joe, we're going to have a birthday cake for you in the break room at, at, at 2 o'clock. And then he walks in and everybody else has eaten the cake before him and there's like the, the leftovers, right? right? That's, not, that's not how you honor someone, is it? And so when it comes to like honoring someone, when it comes to completely giving them the best of your life, you give them the first choice. And that's the difference between giving something and giving first. Giving God a part of your life instead of giving him the first fruits speaks volume to him. It, it, it speaks so much to the way that you think of him, the way that you prioritize him, the way that you love him, and the way that you live for him. It means that like if you were to just do what Cain did and just bring him something. So what it, the, the picture I get is Cain went out in the fields and he harvested all of his crops and he put it all together and he said, OK, well, I'm going to give this much to God. OK, and he picked what he was going to give to God and he brought it to him and he offered it to him. But that's not what Abel did. Abel said, this is the firstborn, the first thing that's come the first thing, the first increase that I have, and he took that and he killed it, he sacrificed it, and he brought God the fat portions of it. And so Cain brings something, Abel brings the first thing, and so when we just have the attitude that Cain does, it's disrespectful to God, and it's not living by faith. It's not taking that first step of faith and saying, I'm going to give you God the first part. It means that you made sure you had all your needs met and covered before you decided what to give to God. It means that you didn't trust him enough to give your first portions. It means that you made sure all your bills were covered, all your needs and all your wants were covered, and then you decide what to give. It means that you give them the reserves of your time and your energy and your resources. It means that you knew that you would have enough and you had this much left over to give to God instead of saying, no, I'm going to take the very first part of my increase. I'm going to take the very first part of my time, the very first part of my energy, the very first part of my resources, and I'm going to give God that even if I don't know it's going to be enough for me to sustain me for as long as I need to, because it's thinking like you are the only one that can really provide for yourself. And so Cain brought something and Abel brought the first thing. And what you have to understand is there's an even greater reason to give God your first. So you ready for Deuteronomy? There's an even greater reason that God talks about in Deuteronomy to give God your first. Go ahead. When you have finished praying all the tithe of your produce, the third year, which is the year of tithing, then you shall give it to the Levite, to the stranger, to the orphan, and to the widow, so that they may eat within the gates of your city and be satisfied. You shall say before the Lord of God, I have removed the sacred portion of the tithe from my house to God. To the stranger, to the orphan, and to the widow, in accordance with all that you have commanded me. I have not transgressed or forgotten any of your commandments. So God told them to save their first fruits in Deuteronomy. And every three years, they were to take the pile and the, the stuff of their first fruits. And it says they are to give them to the Levites, to the foreigners, 
to the fatherless, and to the widows. Your best, your first, your time, energy, finances, resources, it's not for you. It's for someone else. So when you keep back your first, when you keep back your best, you're just giving someone else and giving God your leftovers. How many of you really love leftovers? You look at that Tupperware container in the fridge and you're like, oh yeah, I can't wait to re-eat the, the uh, mashed potatoes and pork chops I had just last night. It does depend on the leftovers. <laughs> <laughs> if it's Thanksgiving leftovers, I'd like to... Okay, so you don't mind your leftovers. Would you serve your leftovers to a guest that you really wanted to honor? Would you invite someone over from your family or a friend over and say, hey, I got a, pork, a half of a pork chop left and a couple scoops of mashed potatoes and it's got some corn in it because that's the way I like it. No. Like we might like our leftovers and we might be happy with the second best. But would you offer that to anyone else? And that's exactly what Cain did. He offered God his leftovers. That's exactly what we do when we don't give God the first portion. And that's why Abel's offering is better. That's why he gave it by faith. He didn't know the quality or the quantity of the flock that was to come after the first one. He didn't know how many sheep or lamb or whatever he was having. He didn't know what was going to come after that. He didn't know if it was going to be enough wool to harvest to make a sweater that's really going to fit him. That's what living by faith is. It's putting God first. It's giving to God first. And you know, I think about Cain after his offering. It says Cain was very angry and his face was downcast. And I've met so many Christians who try to give like Cain did. I've met so many Christians who try to just give the leftovers. They try to pick and choose what they're going to give to God. They wait to make sure that they're going to be taken care of or have enough. They say, well, they're, they're very stingy with their time, their effort, their resources. And a lot of them share Cain's countenance. They're angry. They're frustrated. They're downcast. Because at the very base of Cain's thinking is anxiety. It's worry. It's fear. Doubt. That's another good one. I didn't write that down. Thank you. How can you live a life of joy and peace how can you be God's ambassadors? How can you really live the way that we're supposed to live as Christians with that as the core of your life? If I give my money, I won't be able to afford to live. If I give my energy and time, you know, I won't be able to do what I want to do. I won't have time for me. If I give this much of myself, I won't be able to sustain it forever. If I volunteer here, I'm going to have to do that for a long time. I just don't have it. And people who live and give and, and bring their offerings to God the way that Cain did, they'll always be miserable. They'll always be worried about themselves. They'll always be worried that you won't have enough, can't do enough. But the most joyful people I have ever met are people that just give it all or give as much as they can. The people that serve, the people that put others first, the people that just bring it to God and say, Lord, this is yours. The people who, who have the most peace about life, have the most faith about life have the, the, you know, the least grip on their time, their finances, their resources. 
And I kind of understand Kane's frustration in it all. Because I think that a lot of times we, we, we only look at things in our own strength. We only look at things in our own financial budget, in your own planning, in your own toil and work and how much you can really get done on your own. I, I, I understand the fear of not being able to always be your best, committing to something and not being able to follow through with it. And you're right, like in your own power, you can't. In your own strength, you can't. In your own finances and abilities, and time, you can't. It's impossible. A couple years ago, I was at a men's conference with Abram. And at this men's conference, it's a little bit of teaching. And I think you were there that year too, I think. And then in the afternoon on Saturday, they have like these competitions and one of them, yes, you were, so Steve did one of the competitions. It was to throw a keg over a pole and you were going for like your highest total there. And <laughs> did you get it over at least? I did. So he got the keg over the pole, but he ripped his pants. And uh, so he had to call Danielle to come give him a new pair. So they had that. They had axe throwing. Um, one of my favorite ones is you throw a, uh, a cast iron skillet as long as far as you can, and whoever throws it the farthest wins it, because those things are heavy. <laughs> but one of the competitions was to lift a tire. Uh, this is a big tire, like a farm-sized tire. And um, so I actually challenged Abram to do it. And do you remember that? Did you think you could? No. Like Abram saw this tire and the tire was basically the size of Abram. And I actually have a video of it. So you pick the tire up and you have to go about 50, 60 feet with it. And so it equates to like 60 times or like 20 times flipping this tire over. And then you get to the end and you got to go back. And you got to do it like another 20 times. It's a huge tire. I actually did it the year before by myself and it's not, it's not easy. And so I told Abram, I said, Abram, you can do this. And he's like, no, no, I can't. I said, okay, fine, I'll help you. I'll do it with you. And so he agreed to do it if I helped him. So that's why you saw me and him doing it. And so Abram, what Abram didn't know was I would bend over and I would act like I was lifting the tire. And I would wait for Abram to try on his own to lift this tire. And so, and he got it. He got it off the ground a little bit. And, but when I felt it stop, then I would come alongside and I would lift it with him the rest of the way. And I would let him flip it. And then he'd flip over and then he'd do the same thing. And I'd, you know, get down with him and I'd wait for him to lift this tire. And I'd wait for him to, 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 to do it himself. And then I'd come alongside and I'd help. And he'd get it off the ground a little bit, but not nearly enough to make the tire go. And that's how we did it. We did it there and back. And, but the key was... I was not going to start lifting that tire without him. If he didn't want to do it, if he didn't even want to try, if he didn't even want to commit to at least getting it up as much as he could, I wasn't going to do the heavy lifting for him. And so when we talk about not being able to do something in our own strength, you can't. You don't have the ability to sustain everything that God's called you to do for a long time. But the picture I want you to get is when you give your first fruits, when it's your first 10% of your finances, when it's the first 10% of your resources, 
when it's the first 10% of your efforts and your energy and your prayer life? That's your commitment to the effort. And then God comes in and He helps you the rest of the way. God's the same way I was with the tire. He just wants to see if you're actually going to try. If you're actually going to step out in faith. If you're actually going to commit to it and do it and say yes to it. And then He comes along and He lifts the tire the rest of the way. But so many times what I personally do if I feel like God wants me to do something or commit to something or step out in faith in something, I expect him to do all the heavy lifting and then I just kind of come in at the end and just tap, push it over. But God's like, no, I want you to commit to the first step, the first portion, the first fruit. What he's asking us to, to do, what he's asking us to give, what he's asking us to be a part of, we might not have the ability to finish it, but we have the ability to start it. It proves to him that you're going to at least try. Some people say, you know, I'll help with that project. I'll help with that vision. I'll help with that, you know, that cleanup day. I'll help with giving towards that. And, and, and then, you know, they commit to it, but they only commit what they think they can. You're living like Cain when you do that. You're doing what you think you are capable of. You think you're, you're doing what you can handle. And so this morning, that's the question I have. That's kind of the step of faith I want us to take. It's like, what area of my life am I not giving God the first of? That first push of my money, that first push of my time, that first push of my energy, that first push of my prayer life, that first push of committing to something. And I think that God has called people in here to commit to something. Starting something, doing something, joining something. Maybe there's an area in your life that you, you're kind of hesitant to jump into because you don't think you'll be able to finish what you start. And God's just calling you to get the first 10% off the ground. I think there's like a project at work. I think there's something in your neighborhood. I think there's something with a coworker or a friend. I think there's an area even here at church that you know you're committed to. You know you're supposed to help. You know you're supposed to step into that person's life. You know you're supposed to speak into that person's life. You know you're supposed to disciple them. You know you're supposed to bring them along. With you. But you're like, God, I can't even see how that's going to finish. God, I can't commit to that because I don't know if I can sustain it. God, I can't commit to that amount of money because I don't know if you're really going to provide it. God, I can't commit to this. I can't do this. I can't take that step because you're so worried about the end. But God's just like, just lift the tire just a little. Start with your first fruits. Give me the first part of your day, the first part of your energy, the first thought, the first prayer. Put your energy, your effort, your resources, your time, put God first in that. So what is God asking? start the heavy lifting so that he can come in and help you finish let's just take a moment let God speak to us here
Lord, it's my desire. It's my goal in life to bring you the best offering that I possibly can. It's my goal to not bring you my leftovers, not bring you the part of me that I know I can give. It's my goal that when you speak of my actions and my decisions, that you speak well of them, that I hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. It's my goal, God, to leave a legacy beyond my life. On my life, my actions, my decisions, to still speak even after I'm gone. So God, I give you, I give you my first fruits this week. I just commit that, to God. And Lord, I don't even know what I'm praying in every sense because you may ask of me something that I'm not ready to give. But Lord, I commit that I'm going to make it the first priority. Lord, I know all the areas that I'm not giving you the first fruits of. I know all the areas that I'm not stepping out first. I know all the areas that I'm not giving you the priority in my life. And I just, I, I ask for your forgiveness for that. I'm sorry that I haven't made you first. I'm sorry. Jesus' name, amen.